Dr. Frank Fincham attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, where he obtained his PhD in psychology. He has since been Director of Clinical Training at the University of Illinois and at the University of Buffalo before assuming his current position as eminent scholar and Director of the Florida State University Family Institute. A fellow of several professional societies, including the American Psychological Society, the American Psychological Association, the British Psychological Society, and the National Council for Family Relations, his work on relationships has been distinguished by numerous professional or recognized by numerous professional awards, including the President's Award for, quote, Distinguished Contributions to Psychological Knowledge, end quote. And the Bearshide Hatfield Award for Sustained, Substantial, and Distinguished Contributions to the Field of Personal Relationships. He's been listed among the top 25 psychologists in the world uh, by way of the number of citations per published article, according to the American Psychology Society Observer. Uh, Dr. Fincham is going to be speaking today on the subject, Is the Path to a Healthy Relationship Common Sense or Counterintuitive? Lessons Learned from Research on Forgiveness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fincham. What I'm going to do today is provide some context for my comments and then I'm going to just ask a few simple questions like what is forgiveness and does it matter and is it relevant to my relationship, meaning my romantic relationship. I'll talk about some of the dangers and what you need to watch out for in uh, forgiveness. And then I'll ask the question, can forgiveness be taught? Can you become a more forgiving person? Then I'll wrap up by concluding with uh, some comments about the question I posed. So let's look at research. This is scientific research since 1900 to 1990. Look at all the papers that you'll find on revenge, retaliation, and retribution. Now look at all the publications you find on forgiveness. <laughs> Yet, forgiveness has been explicitly acknowledged as a fundamental part of human existence for thousands of years. And we know so little about it from a scientific point of view. But, while there were only five scientific studies on the topic of forgiveness prior to 1985, by 2009, there were 108 papers in that year alone. There are now literally hundreds of scientific papers on forgiveness. And what are these papers really about? I have to put my construct in context for you. We can, we can see forgiveness and approach it from two different perspectives. A religious perspective, where it is central to the Abrahamic faiths, or a secular perspective. And within the secular perspective, we can distinguish between prescriptive or moral views of forgiveness versus those that are descriptive. And this is where I'm situated, in the secular world of descriptive analysis. So be clear that that's where I'm talking from today. What is forgiveness? Well, both conceptual and empirical answers are available. The research that you find in the field has focused mainly on the conceptual side of things, where people have taken their own views of forgiveness and put them to the empirical test. But let's start with an empirical answer. How do people understand forgiveness? So let's take a question from a national survey. If you really forgive someone, you'd want that person to be released from the consequences of their actions. Is that not accurate, somewhat accurate, or very accurate? By way of hands, let's see how this divides. Who would say that's not accurate? And don't be shy. Okay, maybe half. Somewhat accurate? Okay, a good number. Very accurate. Yes, we do have an outlier. Congratulations. <laughs> well, what we found was these percentages fully 60% of people saying that that was somewhat accurate or very accurate. For people with that response, the answer to my question is that having a healthy relationship for you is going to be counterintuitive. For those who said not accurate, 
maybe for you it will be a little more natural. And you'll see what I mean now. Let's begin with some conceptual hygiene. Uh, you all had a shower this morning, so let's clean up our concepts now. <laughs> for forgiveness to occur, there must be an injury. And that injury must be negligently or intentionally inflicted upon you. In other words, there needs to be someone responsible for injuring you. Absent an injury and absent responsibility for that injury, the question of forgiveness does not arise. So, a common response to a transgression is immediate fear of, or anger, or both. In fact, some commentators have said that retaliation is deeply ingrained in the biological, psychological, and cultural levels of human nature. And us usually these responses are experienced as negative. And how one deals with this negative response is quite critical, as I now want to show you. How do you deal with a negative emotional state? One of the things that a lot of people do, mea culpa, I bet everybody in this room has done it as well, is you ruminate about it. You think about it. And then you slowly nurture your grudge and plot on how you're going to get even. Now, the problem with ruminating is that we have data to show that that's very costly to you. The only person that gets hurt by your rumination is you. You can exact revenge, and I bet you most people here have exacted revenge at some stage in their life. The problem with revenge is that there can be no end to it, because the minute you take your revenge, the original perpetrator feels as though they've been wrong, and so they'll get back at you, and there is no end to the cycle. So these are not good responses, but they're common ones. Is there a more adaptive response? Well, I want to suggest to you that there is, and it is forgiveness. But let's continue scrubbing up our construct, because we want to make sure it's clean and pristine without any misunderstandings floating around on its surface. Forgiveness is something that occurs in full knowledge that the transgressor is responsible for the injury that somebody hurt you when they shouldn't have hurt you, that that person is thereby not entitled to your sympathy, your affection, or your trust, and that you have a right to feel resentful for what they did to you. <coughs> Forgiveness involves working through not avoiding this emotional pain where you feel you have a right to this negative uh, feeling that, that uh, has been instigated through the transgression. Hence Gandhi's statement, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. If you are a weak person, you cannot forgive someone. Why? Because in order to forgive someone, you have to hold them accountable for their action. You have to be able to acknowledge that what they did was wrong. That you deserved better as a human being. That you are a person of worth who shouldn't be treated that way. So you have to be strong to forgive. The weak can never forgive. They just become doormats. So. You're going to forgive and forget, right? No, never forget that phrase. <laughs> Remember what one of our most famous presidents said, forgive your enemies, but never forget their names. <laughs> true, true statement, and one that has profound insight. Let's strip it down to essentials. We've just seen that forgiving is not the same as forgetting. It's not the same as having no consequences for the transgressor's behavior. 
they did something wrong, that doesn't mean there should be no consequences for what they did, just because you forgive them. It doesn't mean no longer feeling the pain or grieving the injury that was done to you. It is not pretending that their unacceptable behavior is in fact not so bad after all and, well, let's not make a big deal, let's just accept it. Forgiveness is not, and this is the one that may cause you the most tr trouble, the same as reconciliation. So, we stripped it down to some essential components here. And a lot of people understand forgiveness as being the same as a cancelled debt, but not quite. Not quite. Why? Because relinquishing a debt from a debt makes it the case that there is no longer a debt. Forgiving does not make it the case that there was no longer a wrong done. You forgive and you still acknowledge there was a wrong. So it's not the same as forgiving a debt. A better way to think about forgiveness is more like an altruistic gift. It is something that is intentionally given to the person that is unconditioned and it's super erogatory. Super erogatory simply meaning beyond the call of duty. You don't have to forgive someone, but you go beyond the call of duty and you choose to forgive them. And it is more than an act. Forgiveness is not saying, I forgive you. Now, why is that? To say I promise is to make a promise, even if I have no intention of keeping the promise. But to say I forgive you does not thereby constitute forgiveness, even if I fully intend to forgive you. Notice the difference between I'll try to promise. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I'll try to promise you I'll be there on time? Doesn't make sense. Because to say, I promise I'll be there on time, is performative. By uttering the words, I promise to be there on time, I have performed a promise. To say, I forgive you, is not to perform the act of forgiveness. That's why it makes sense to say, I'll try to forgive you. That's not the same as saying, I'll try to promise you. The one makes sense and the other doesn't. What you're doing when you say, I forgive you, is you're signaling your intention. What you're really saying is that, I'm going to try to forgive you. But what does the listener hear? It can be inherently problematic, because you say, I forgive you, and the person who is being forgiven doesn't hear, I forgive you. They hear, it's over. Good. Now we don't have to talk about it ever again. Now, to say I forgive you can also be problematic for other reasons. Even when you have good intentions, you may be unaware that the statement is not performative and you yourself think that by making the statement you're forgiving the person and you're in trouble if you're coming from that place. You can poorly execute a statement like I forgive you. You can say it with condescension, you can say it with great moral superiority, not a good idea. You can use it as a put down, you can use it as a form of retaliation, you can use it as an attempt to humiliate the other person. That is not forgiveness. Those are not things I would recommend you try to do. And don't forget that statements like I forgive you can be used strategically. Even when you don't forgive the person, you can try and lull them back into a sense of security so that you can really zing them. <laughs> That's something that you might call hollow forgiveness. Forgiveness is a response to being wronged that entails a change of heart. And if you've changed your heart, you are not going to say to someone, I forgive you, as an attempt to put them down, as an attempt to retaliate. You have, by deciding to forgive them, made a decision to give up your justified anger and resentment and indignation that you feel for what they did to you. So, forgive entails a 
Forgiving entails a struggle. You've got to overcome those negative feelings. And I don't know how much experience you've had or been psychologically aware of how negative feelings have a habit of not just going away when you want them to go away. They resurface from time to time. So forgiving somebody is not something that is very easily achieved. But when it is achieved, the transgressor receives an undeserved good and is and an undeserved gift, and is given something that is truly super erogatory. So, just to recap, forgiveness is not giving up the right to protect yourself from future harm. Forgiveness is not a synonym for stupidity. If you have a romantic partner who physically beats you, you don't forgive them and go back into the context so that they can beat you some more. So forgiveness is not for the domestic violence victim, or is it? I would argue it is, because forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. I can protect myself from future harm and forgive. I can remove myself from the situation and forgive. Forgiveness is not a synonym for stupidity. It is not the same as forgetting. It's not a passive removal of the, the harm from your consciousness. It is not condoning and saying what they did really wasn't a, so bad in the first place. Forgiveness, remember, annuls not the wrong itself. The wrong will always be a wrong. But what forgiveness does is that it removes the distorting effect of that wrong on the relationship with the wrongdoer and with you, the victim's view of yourself, because you deserve better than that. That's why you have to be strong to forgive. So it doesn't matter. Now we've scrubbed up our concept nicely. It's still not clean, by the way. For those of you who are really uh, perspicacious, you will notice that it's not yet clean. So we have a transgression that can produce fear or anger, behaviorally manifest in withdrawing from the transgressor, from trying to retaliate or get even with the transgressor, and so on. These are unpleasant physiological states that exert a toll on you. Here is what we know from research. If you ruminate or nurse a grudge, you're going to have a negative experience you're going to experience more sympathetic nervous symptom activity. You're going to have a higher heart rate. You're going to have more galvanic skin response. These are all physiological signs of anxiety. You're going to have increased systolic and diastolic blood pressure and mean arterial pressure. You will have higher tonic eye and brow muscle tension. People have actually hooked up victims of transgressions and had them, when they've forgiven those transgressions and when they haven't forgiven them. And these are some of the differences you see. There's much less arousal when you forgive. And why does this matter? It matters because when chronic, the anger and hostility that characterize ongoing vengeful rumination is linked to very serious health outcomes. It increases your probability of experiencing heart disease and dying. So, unforgiveness is life-threatening. If you want to live longer, you become a more forgiving person. I can't make a more profound argument for embracing, or at least entertaining the concept of becoming a more forgiving person than this. Well, maybe I've convinced you, maybe I haven't. Let me give it another shot. Is it relevant to my relationships and my life? I mean, after all, I'm different. We know this, the universe centers around me, right? You just heard that from the previous speaker. <laughs> I don't have a need for this. If we really want to love, we must learn how to forgive Mother Teresa. Don't take my word for it. I happen to think that she's right. <laughs> 
But now for the bad news. William Blake, some of you may have heard of him. He was a, a poet, I believe. <laughs> it is easier to forgive an enemy than to forgive a friend. Wow. Both very insightful observations. Let's go onwards now. Regardless of this, Robert Quillen, who was a garrison keeler of his day in the 1930s, said that a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Look, I'll be honest with you. Who's the person I fight with the most in this world? My wife. <laughs> Nobody comes close. In fact, I think, I think marriage was invented to prevent us from fighting with strangers. <laughs> and if you, look at, if you look at people who've been married for 50 years and who have happy marriages, they say that one of the most important things that allowed them to get to this point was the ability to both forgive and be forgiven. So, people in the street say it as well. Now, we need to distinguish in relationships forgiveness from reconciliation. There is no contradicted, contradiction involved in forgiving your spouse and at the same time filing for divorce. Those are not contradictory acts. It may be prudent and wise to end the relationship. That doesn't mean you can't forgive the person. Likewise, people can reconcile with each other without actually forgiving. And you see many marriages where people have past hurts that have never been forgiven in their marriage. That's when they end up seeing a, a therapist like me and I if I was practicing today, I'd happily take their money, but I'm not. I stopped practicing about five years ago. Remember, we do our forgiving alone inside our hearts and minds. What happens to the people we forgive depends, and I would say, in part, on them. That's by um, a popular writer on forgiveness by the name of Smeads. So... I hope to have made the case that forgiveness is integral to close relationships, that you can't have a close relationship without forgiveness. Because close relationships are paradoxical. Our deepest affiliative needs occur in close relationships, but we have relationships with imperfect partners. Nobody in this room will go through life and experience a close relationship in which they are never hurt, let down, or felt betrayed. By definition, your partner is not perfect. I, maybe if you marry to Christ, that's different. But if you marry to somebody on this earth, you will experience these things. It's a given. It's like death and taxes. Add that to your phraseology now. The only certain things in life are that are death, taxes, and I'm going to be hurt in my close relationships. Why? Because in a close relationship, we make ourselves vulnerable. That's what makes close relationships the wonderful things they are. We experience incredible increases in well-being when we're in a close relationship like a marriage. But because we can experience this well-being, because we make ourselves vulnerable, we can also experience a, a lot of hurt as well. So close relationships bring the potential for a wonderful sense of well-being, a wonder, not so wonderful, a horrible sense of being hurt. So you take the good with the bad, and you hope there's more good than bad. Although my wife and I, we've had some pretty, pretty nasty fights over the 33 years we've been married. We got through it. You, you'll get through it. You will be hurt. 
There will be times when the last thing on your mind is that I want to forgive this person. But hang in there. Over the course of a relationship, alternatives to forgiveness, I would argue, things like denial, oh, she's not so nasty towards me, or oh, that wasn't so bad, or well, you know, he only did that because, you know, he views the world in that quirky way. They just won't survive. I would argue you need forgiveness. Now, forgiveness needs further examination because there's still a little bit of dirt on our little construct. So we need to go back and perform a proper wash of this construct. There is a consensus among scientists that the resentment and anger, retaliatory impulses, all those nasty, horrible, negative things that come about when somebody wrongs you are overcome in forgiveness. Nobody would question that. That is absolutely accepted by everybody in the research field. <coughs> but my question is, is that enough for you in your close relationship? that my wife doesn't feel angry towards me. I've got a good marriage. My wife doesn't feel angry towards me. Is that what you want to be able to say? I don't think so. Not being mad doesn't mean that you feel good or positive. I'm not mad at you doesn't mean I feel good about you. Just like the opposite of illness is not health, or the absence of illness is not health. Equally fundamental to forgiveness is an attitude of real goodwill towards the offender as a person. And thank goodness for philosophers, because that's a philosopher that said that in the 80s and psychologists, because they don't read philosophy, much to their detriment, miss out. And so we have a whole literature on forgiveness that is really not about forgiveness. It's about the absence of unforgiveness. And so I have tried to make the literature move in a direction where we actually look not only at the decrease in unforgiveness, but an increase in something positive that we can call forgiveness. Forgiveness thus entails a positive or benevolent motivational state towards the harm doer. And that forms the basis for our approach behavior towards them if we've decided that it is prudent and safe to continue the relationship. But here's the bad news. Here's a slide that shows you levels of forgiveness plotted against levels of unforgiveness. And you can see that even people who say that they have completely forgiven still harbor some level of unforgiveness. So this forgiveness thing is not that easy. And that's the whole point of this slide. That even though you feel you feel fully forgiven, there is another separate dimension out there of unforgiveness that may not be zero. Forgiveness is related to central relationship characteristics. It's related to relationship commitment. It's related to the closeness of the relationship. It's related to relationship satisfaction. And it's related to conflict resolution. I'm going to take a quick detour now to tell you a little bit about forgiveness and how it differs for victims and perpetrators. Both victims and perpetrators have biased views of the, the transgression. Victims tend to overlook details that facilitate forgiving. They embellish their memories with details that make forgiving more difficult. This is done in studies where we actually get people to remember scenarios that have been, a, that there's objective evidence for. And this is the kind of distortion that victims make. Perpetrators, on the other hand, embellish details that facilitate forgiving. In short, perpetrators think it wasn't as bad as victims think it was. Victims think it's a whole lot worse than the perpetrator thinks it was. 
And that's why it's so hard to do this forgiveness thing right. Because if the perpetrator is thinking they're having to make amends for something far bigger than what they did. And the victim thinks they're not making big enough events, uh, amends for what they did. Tricky business. Both of them are right, though. Just think of relationship satisfaction. There's a positive association with forgiveness, and the causal direction seems to, to be bi-directional. Here's a simple recursive model. Uh, I won't bother you with it. Um, I know the figures will put some of you to sleep immediately. But this is just what I did was measure marital quality at time one and at time two, forgiveness at time one and at time two. And what you see here is a cross-lag model where the path from the time one variable to the other time two variable, that is the cross-lag, you can see they are both fairly healthy. 0.25 and 0.30, they were highly significant. Showing that your initial marital quality predicts later forgiveness, your earlier forgiveness predicts later marital quality. And if you do a non-recursive model, you get the same thing happening. The, the direction is from marital quality to forgiveness and from forgiveness to marital quality. So the two things influence each other. I promise you I won't throw any more numbers at you. <laughs> but I will tell you that the retaliation and avoidance among husbands is linked to wives' reported inability to or ineffective conflict resolution. That lack of forgiveness among wives is linked to husbands' reported ineffective conflict resolution. And what blew me away, wives' forgiveness predicted how much husbands reported that they resolved conflict with their wives 12 months later. And in this study, um, the mechanism that I identified for the link between forgiveness and satisfaction was unresolved conflict. Because when in science you're all about discovering why things happen, not just that they happen. You want to explain them. And I think this link is explainable through unresolved conflict. If you don't resolve the conflict, then you're in trouble. So what determines forgiveness? There are individual differences. There are explanations for the offender's behavior. There's empathy, if you are more empathic towards a transgressor. Humility, if you are more humble. Now notice, most of these are under volitional control. Other factors that influence forgiveness are things like the offense, severity. More severe wrongs are harder to forgive than less severe wrongs. Transgressor behavior can influence forgiveness. A sincere apology from the transgressor makes it easier to forgive. But not all transgressors will apologize or think what they did is wrong. And sometimes you even have to forgive in, under those circumstances. So what should I watch out for? Remember the victim and perpetrator biases. The amends made are seen as disproportionate by both people, and both people are right. The, the person you're forgiving won't agree with the way you saw the transgression, so don't try and convince them to. Remember, I forgive you is not forgiveness. It's just the beginning of a process. Now remember, relationships have a history. So we can talk about specific hurts in a relationship, and we can talk about hurtful relationships. If you're in a hurtful relationship, maybe forgiveness without reconciliation is an option worth considering. And finally, forgiveness is the sort of thing that one does for a reason. And where there are reasons, there is a distinction between good ones and bad ones. 
don't forgive for the wrong reasons, because that's not going to work. Remember, the partner transgression that you experience has put you in a position of moral superiority vis-a-vis -vis your partner. This is a chance for you to abuse your position. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Forgiving out of felt obligation is not as beneficial as forgiveness freely given. For people of faith, this is a danger. Do not forgive because your religious beliefs, simply because your religious beliefs say you should forgive. Forgive because that is an instantiation of you living out your religious beliefs. If you feel pressure from the church or from members of your student religious society or from your mosque or, or from your shul to forgive, and you forgive because of that pressure, you're not going to experience the benefits as much as if you chose freely to forgive. Can forgiveness be taught? Absolutely. 27 studies have been done to show that you can become more forgiving. So, no excuses, okay? <laughs> not even a doctor's script will get you out of this one. The first step is to understand what forgiveness is and is not. 87% of those 27 studies include that as a component. Recall the hurt. Don't try and avoid thinking about the hurt. Recall it and work through it, but don't ruminate on it. 95% of the studies have that as a component. And then and a very important component is the victim needs to learn how to empathize with the transgressor. See it from the transgressor's point of view. You know, it's trite, but it's true. Stand in their shoes, walk a mile in their shoes, and it'll look very different. Now I'm going to venture where others fear to tread. Um, I'm going to talk about prayer. So we get undergraduates, we bring them in the, into the laboratory, and we get them to do one of two things. They are randomly assigned to either describe their partner to a parent or to pray for the partner. And we tell them how to pray. And guess what? Those who pray, when we assess them subsequently, are more forgiving of partner transgressions than those who describe the partner to the parent. Well, that's very nice. You, that's, very, that's very psyche, isn't it? But it's not very real. What about the real world? Well, we had people do the same kind of thing for four weeks in a diary study, where we randomly assigned dating undergraduates or undergraduates who said they were in a committed relationship. Sorry, you don't date when you're an undergraduate. Remember the previous talk. <laughs> and we randomly assigned them to pray for the partner to just pray as usual, or to every day spend some time going over some positive thoughts they had about the partner. And they did this for four weeks. Now, very important is how we ask them to pray. It's not magic, it's very simple. We focus on colloquial intercessory prayer. Now, if that sounds like a mouthful to you, I understand. So, this is what we tell them. Please read these instructions and then pray on behalf of your partner. I'll give you a minute to read it because I'm not going to insult you by reading it out to you. Unless there's anyone here who's visually impaired, just put your hand up and I'll read it. Okay, a very simple very short little prayer. That's what we want them to do every day for four weeks. And guess what? Those who pray for the partner at the end of four weeks show greater forgiveness than the other two groups. People are randomly assigned. Remember, this is a scientific experiment. People who prayed as usual were no different from people who had positive thoughts about their partner. So just, it's not, this is not 
supporting prayer. Don't get me wrong. This is not about prayer works. It is about a particular form of prayer that is directed towards the partner's well-being. Because when people prayed as usual, we didn't get findings. Okay, so I've shown that prayer can lead to greater forgiveness in a relationship, even with undergraduates. I say even because, you know, undergraduates don't have relationships, right? Or, no, they, they just don't date. By the way, in my own research, just as, as an aside, I have found when I ask undergraduate students, and I do it by the hundreds, about a thousand a semester, who are in committed, exclusive relationships, how that relationship began. 66% report it began as a physical hookup. As a hookup. You know what a hookup is? Do I have to explain that to you? Okay, if I do, then we're in trouble. Okay, I've also shown that prayer increases the amount of gratitude that you feel, which is good because we know gratitude is related to better mental health. It's also related to better relationships. So these are good things, right? So I've shown that prayer can protect relationships. But what about risk factors for relationships? What is the single biggest risk factor for relationships on campus? Well, I'll answer it by asking a question. Does talking to God make people less inclined to drink? And I was blown away when I got these results. Totally blown away. Because we had people engage in four weeks of prayer and we monitored their alcohol intake. And it decreased by 50% by the end of four weeks. I didn't believe that and I said to the student involved, I don't believe that, I'm not publishing it, do it again. So we did it again. The next study decreased by 49%. That's when I was willing to publish it. Now we've done one last study I want to tell you about. We have people praying for their partner and we monitored their messing about, their cheating, their little flings on the side. And we found that Prayer for the partner decreases infidelity. And we know on campuses that there's a lot of infidelity, even in, quote, committed relationships. The number of committed relationships where people are having sex with someone else is kind of strange. It makes you wonder, what do people understand by a committed relationship? So, is the path to a healthy relationship common sense or counterintuitive? It depends on the state of your existing relationship, as sometimes virtues are not virtues in relationships. I'm sorry to make life difficult, but here are some data. What you see in this little graphic is change in relationship satisfaction in the first year of marriage. Notice, first of all, it's all downhill. There is nothing above zero. So the first year of marriage is not you get happier, you get less happy. And if you look at the, if you look at the filled in bars, those are people who are more forgiving of their spouse. And those who are less forgiving. And you will see that in less hostile relationships, those who are less forgiving experience a greater decline in marital satisfaction. But look at the more hostile relationships now and you'll see those who are more forgiving experience a greater decline in marital satisfaction. So whether forgiveness is good for you in your relationship in your first year of marriage depends in part how hostile your partner is and how well behaved they are. If they show higher levels of bad behavior, you don't want to be too forgiving because then they just think it's acceptable behavior and your marital satisfaction goes down because they say, okay, this is good, I can go out Friday nights, drink with the boys, stay out till four in the morning, maybe I'll meet someone, maybe I'll even have a hookup like I did before I got married. No, that gets you into trouble. But if you're in a less problematic relationship, 
forgiving does work. So it depends. Sometimes virtues aren't virtues, depending on the context in which you exercise them. And it also depends on your understanding of forgiveness. If you're someone who thinks that forgiving means a person shouldn't be held to experience the consequences of what they did, then your satisfaction is going to go down too. Uh, so, depending on how you conceptualize forgiveness, it may be common sense for you, or it may be counterintuitive in having a healthy relationship. Now let's move on to how do you forgive? A forgiveness in action. Remember, forgiveness is a day-to-day -day attitude of graciousness. It's not demanding perfection from the other person. It's marked by kindness and a generosity of spirit. Have a structured plan for dealing with the wounds inflicted by your partner. Some preliminaries. Be empathic. See things through your partner's eyes. That helps a great deal. Accept that your partner's views and memory may differ from yours. Remember, you're going to feel the pain more than your partner who inflicted the pain. Your partner is going to see all the extenuating circumstances for what they did. Try and see your partner as a whole person. They ask more than just what they did to you. Remember, if you ever say, I forgive you, and I'd recommend you never use those words in your life. Only use the words, I will try to forgive you. Because that way there's going to be less possibility for miscommunication. Because when you utter those words, that is just the beginning. It's not the end of the matter. And be patient. Be patient with yourself. And with your partner. Set an agenda to work on the issue in question. Fully explore the pain you've experienced and your concerns around this issue. The, the transgressor might have some concerns that also need to be addressed, as well as your concerns about the wrong. There is no quick fix for serious wounds in a relationship. This takes time. You may need to explore this, the situation and your feelings by yourself, independently of your partner. Trying to move through forgiveness too quickly can get you into a lot of trouble. And maybe worse than doing nothing at all. The, ideally, the offender, your partner, would apologize and ask for forgiveness. That's the perfect scenario. Because asking for forgiveness demonstrates a willingness to take responsibility and to change, it also validates your pain that you're experiencing and what your partner won't realize, but which is likely to be the case, is that they may have to ask you for forgiveness more than once because you're going to experience that hurt again some other time. When some behavior they engage in symbolically represents the behavior that hurt you and all those old feelings will come flooding back and you will be upset and they won't understand why you're upset because but you told me you forgave me well yeah i did but i'm still dealing with some of that pain and sometimes with very serious hurts like infidelity this can occur years later so you agree to forgive and remember, this is a process, not an event. And if you do this, then maybe it'll help if you recall times when you needed to be forgiven. We are all broken. Nobody in this room is perfect. We have all offended someone and have needed to be forgiven. 
remembering that when you're the victim can be very helpful. If you sit on your pedestal being self-righteous, it's going to make it really hard. Make a positive commitment to change if there are recurrent patterns. If what you're forgiving is something that's happened four or five times, make sure that there's a commitment on the part of the partner to change that pattern of behavior. And then move forward in this process. Forgiveness often takes many discussions between partners and a lot of work by each person individually. And it takes time. Should the issue come up in a conflict, all is not lost. It will come up in a moment of anger. Even highly motivated partners are, after all, human beings. Don't dwell on it. Just move on. Know that it's going to come up. All those old feelings will come flooding back. But stick to that commitment that you made. And discuss it with your partner and tell them that, gee, you know, all those old feelings, you know, that's why I snapped at you, etc. Don't try to move through it too fast. And if you do all this, maybe you can change from this kind of relationship to this kind. <laughs> I'm indebted to my colleague Steve Beach and Nate Lambert in this work. If you're interested in anything I've had to say today, I pride myself on keeping an up-to-date web page where you can access every single paper I've ever written. And there's the web address. And most of all, I think we need forgiveness, not just in our personal relationships. And if I were a, a groups-related person, we need it to coexist. Thank you. just identified a great doctoral thesis. <laughs> Seriously, if you'd like to come to Florida State University, we can, we can work on that. There is virtually nothing out there on the impact of forgiveness on the transgressor. I, I think there's one study that shows some benefit on the transgressor as well. By the way, something that hasn't come up but that I've also written about is self-forgiveness. Can you forgive another person without forgiving yourself? Interesting question. Let's not address it right now, but self-forgiveness is a big, huge thing as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fincham. Um, Aaron Colson from uh, Dartmouth College. Um, I was wondering if you uh, would offer your thoughts on what communal forgiveness of another community um, would look like uh, whether it looks the same as interpersonal, you know, forgiveness of one person to another. Uh, thank you. Um, you raise an excellent, excellent point. It is generally considered amongst the people in this field, and I respect the philosophers who write on this, that it's not really possible to forgive unless, on behalf of another person. You have to have been a victim. So there are these incredible treaties on, where, on you know, the Holocaust and whether people who weren't direct victims of the Holocaust <coughs> can engage in a forgiveness process. I'm not going to speak on that. Let me make a couple of other quick points. First of all, I recognize that there are phenomena that can occur at a group level that transcend the some of the individuals that comprise the group. I respect that, I acknowledge that. 
At the same time, I'm keenly aware that groups are comprised of human beings who are individuals. Um, and there needs to be a lot of intergroup forgiveness. Take, for example, my home country. I would, I would hold up for you the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was convened in South Africa as being a great example of a process whereby one group can forgive another and so forth. And that process takes place through the experiences of individuals who testify at the Commission. But yet, the impact transcends the individual's experiences and it does something for the society, for the groups involved. I don't know how that works, but I just know it does work. And I know that if it hadn't been for Nelson Mandela being the first president of South Africa, post-apartheid, it wouldn't have happened because he was a man who forgave and valued forgiveness. In fact, Bishop Desmond Tutu was a, a patron of this attempt to establish a field of forgiveness research. I find it very interesting that out of South Africa comes this incredible example for the world on how to conduct human affairs under very, very difficult circumstances. The richness, the humanity, the potential that is South Africa. I'm proud to have grown up in that country. So I would say things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where people come in and they admit to their wrongdoing, they ask forgiveness, others come in and, and testify about how they were hurt, how they've lost <coughs> loved ones, how angry they are, and then at, at some sort of public communal level, all of these processes take place and healing can occur. Here. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I have a colleague who believes that great research comes out of anger. <laughs> no, seriously. That in order to be a good scientist, you need to have anger. Because anger is a very powerful emotion that motivates you to action. And so if you find yourself being angry, I would say you can use that anger in good ways or you can use it in bad ways. I use my anger in a good way, and it was very good for my career. I mean, I could have gone and slashed their tires, <laughs> or keyed their cars, but I didn't. Probably because it just didn't occur to me. I mean, it would have been a bit easier. So yes, I agreed with you that a wrong doesn't have to always produce terrible things. You can channel anger in constructive ways, but it's a very, very powerful motivator. Use it to your advantage. 
I would actually like to say something in response to, to Paul's question as well, but I'll maybe do it right at the end. We have a question here that's been holding on for just a little bit, so. Thank you, Dr. Vincent, for your talk. Um, I was wondering, so you say that forgiveness should be freely given, and you also say that it fundamentally entails a change of heart. So if forgiveness ultimately depends on an inner emotion, how does that correspond with a free choice? It seems like a free choice involves an act of will. So is it, would you say forgiveness is more an emotional state or where you're making an act of will and choosing to forgive? Both, definitely both. Um, and also, I'm not saying you should. My, everything I'm saying is, is, strictly speaking, descriptive. If you make a, a, a choice to forgive freely, you will experience the maximum benefits of, that come along with forgiveness. We have research to show that those who freely forgive, who don't feel any pressure to forgive, actually reap slightly more benefits for, from forgiving than those who feel pressured to. So um, I say you should only in the sense that, that it's descriptively true, but you're right. Um, I should avoid the word should because that's morally prescriptive and my talk wasn't about moral prescription. So then are people just left with waiting for this inner change of feeling? There's nothing really that they can choose to do? They well, forgiveness involves feelings, but it also involves cognition and behavior. You are getting at a very, very critical and important question. Do I run away from the bear because I'm scared, or do I decide I'm scared because I find myself running away from the bear? This is an old, age-old question in psychology. Which comes first, the cognition or the emotion? And it's, it's a bit like nature and nurture. I don't think we get anywhere by debating this terribly much. Um, because they, under different circumstances, it can go different ways. But a lot of our cognition occurs at a non-conscious level. We've got tons of studies to show that I can get you to behave certain ways without you even knowing, by priming you subliminally with certain stimuli. That's why subliminal advertising is not allowed in theatres. If you had a subliminal Coke can appear on the screen now, you would all go out and you'd be more likely to buy a coat if you were primed subliminally. So even though you might not be conscious of working through something, it doesn't mean you aren't thinking about it. People make a distinction between controlled and automatic processing. Automatic processing occurs outside of awareness. But I'm suggesting that as an act of will within controlled processing in a state of consciousness and awareness you can make a decision to forgive that doesn't mean it's easy your heart might be way behind you and not want to forgive and it's very interesting if you look at different religious traditions for example I understand that in Jewish law Forgiveness is something that is defined behaviorally. It is not an act of the heart. Whereas in Christianity, it comes as an act of the heart first, and then you behave, because your heart has changed. In Jewish law, apparently, if you, if you wrong someone, then they have an obligation to forgive you if you go and ask for forgiveness. So you go and ask for forgiveness, say, I wronged you, I'm sorry, please will you forgive me, and there is an obligation or an expectation that you then forgive. It's not something that it comes from the heart, but is prescribed under the law. And then the behavior follows granting the forgiveness. I happen in my philosophical orientation in psychology to be what is called a cognitive behavioral psychologist. I, I actually believe in 
the precedence of behavior often. That if you behave differently, your heart will follow you eventually. It may take a little time to get there. But I'm all for an action oriented. If you're depressed, one of the best things you can do is to get up and behave. The worst thing you can do if you're depressed is to sit in your room and be depressed. Get out, go for a walk, do something. And often in therapy you will find that people who come in for problems like the depression uh, are given homework tasks that involve behavioral enactment. So I do think you can will yourself into forgiveness by starting with a conscious decision that you're going to try to forgive. That doesn't mean it's easy. I wonder if I could exercise the chair's prerogative for a, a follow-up on, on this question that also goes to some of what Professor Kerry was, was asking about. And I was left curious, and I, I want to push you on the normative mm -hmm. aspect here. I mean, why should one forgive? I mean, if one attended to all the empirical data that you, you gave, you might get the impression that the reason was that you would feel better about yourself and you'd do well in your relationships. And yet, if you think about um, the Christian demand for forgiveness as coming from the heart, it looks like it's, it emerges from a uh, prescription to love your neighbor, mm -hmm. which can't be done simply for the sake of the benefits. The so I'm, I wonder, where do you see the, the normative heart of forgiveness in terms of why someone should undergo the processes that you're talking about in order to bring themselves to forgive someone else? <coughs> I fully acknowledge that there is a whole two days worth of a religious perspective on forgiveness and I think from a religious perspective it's a whole new ball game that you forgive because you are living out at least from a Christian perspective your Christian beliefs and that there, if, if you feel a pressure to forgive as a Christian, then I say, what kind of Christian life are you living? If you feel it as a pressure. Isn't that what you would do because you're called to do it? That is part of what it means to be a Christian. So, I'm not a theologian, and so I will stop there. <laughs> but, if nothing gets your point across, naked self-interest is not a bad tool. <laughs> I will, we'll close out with one, we have one last question that was, was sent up, and, and it's a question about looking at it from the, about addressing the person who needs to forgive you, and who perhaps won't, and how should we address somebody who we've wronged, um, and who is being intransigent in uh, coming around to the, the need to forgive? Well, I've already pointed out that a sincere apology and how you give the apology is just as important as how you grant forgiveness. If you forgive an apology that is not seen as sincere, don't even bother apologizing. There's been research done on effectiveness of apologies. And apologies that are not viewed as being sincere and heartfelt will get you into trouble. So the first thing you would do is accept responsibility for the action. Tell the person that you recognize that you have wronged them, that you feel badly about it, and you want to really sincerely apologize to them because you realize that they deserve better, that what you did detracts I wouldn't use these words, but detracts from who they are as a human being. Get that across, that they deserve better than what you did. And, you know, if they still don't forgive you, well, you've done all you can do. You're going to have to live. <coughs> Some people don't want to forgive. I mean, that's just the way life is. You can try apologizing again. Under Jewish law, you have to ask for forgiveness three times. Three times. And if you're not granted forgiveness by the victim under Jewish law, you are now forgiven because you asked three times. I'd like to thank our speaker.